got good production. You got a story. Mm -hmm. When Richard Dawkins was asked about the origin of life. If life exists outside our universe, and if so, have aliens made contact with us? One time we were fish. What is the evidence for this? And we're climbing trees. This is not something based on scientific evidence. This is in the world of the apes, monkeys. The first person to actually say that Darwinism was a religion. And here you go. And this is uh, Subhur here on The Dean Show. <laughs> go ahead and subscribe right now. Hit that notification bell. Help us get our numbers back up. Did you know that many years ago, The Dean Show, when we started 2006, we used to broadcast for many years on the Khalifa Clothing Channel, currently known as Digital Minbar. So we're trying to get our numbers back up because the channel at that time got closed. Then we started the official Dean Show channel. We're trying to get our numbers back up to where they should be. And that's this number here, 855, combined with what we currently have, 442. We should be over a million subscribers. Help us to get our numbers back to where they should be. With that small setback that we had many years ago, you guys can help us by subscribing right now and hitting that notification bell. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the show. Salam alaikum. And don't forget to support us on our Patreon page. Dean, the Dean Show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, welcome to the Dean Show, I'm Eddie, your host, subscribe if you haven't already, my next guest, Sabur Ahmed, is the author of the forthcoming book, A Failed Hypothesis, he is part of the Sapiens Institute team, he is a public speaker, debater and writer, he focuses on engaging with new the new atheism, and has also traveled extensively across the globe, teaching Muslims how to articulate Islam to non-Muslims. Subhur specializes in the philosophy of science with a focus on Darwin's theory of evolution. He has debated many prominent atheists over the years, including professors, atheist activists, and internet personalities on the topics of science, God's existence, and Darwinism. He has given talks across North America, Latin America, Australia, Africa. The list goes on. Subhur has an MA in philosophy from Birkbeck College, University of London. He is currently a PhD candidate specializing in the philosophy of biology. You got to know him a little bit. Now you're going to get to know him a little bit more as we talk about evolution and also this new religion. There's so many man-made religions. Another one's been added to the bunch called scientism. So let's... Enjoy this week's show with our brother, our guest, Spur Ahmed. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Eddie. How, How you doing? doing? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Alhamdulillah. So you heard me uh, talk about this new religion. There's so many man-made religions. It seems like there's a new one added to the bunch. Have you heard of it, scientism? Yeah, scientism is a very interesting one. Um, as you know, Eddie, that you know you've been you've been on the internet long enough to know that every couple of years something becomes more popular than others um and you get these uh you know new age beliefs you get all these different types of things so scientism is one of those things that's always been there in the background but the last couple of years it's really come to the fore so scientism is essentially using the cloak of science to push out a religious ideology, a philosophy. So it's it's using the word science and uh, and the language of science and the, if you like, the status of uh, scientists to actually push out something which is nothing to do with science. So we can define it um, uh, in, in the following way. It is an excessive belief in the scientific method. And at a popular level, this leads to some very false claims by, by people who uh, subscribe to scientism. So the thing is, firstly, no one will call themselves a scientism uh, proponent, right? They will not say, I believe in scientism. They'll just say things like, and I'm going to ask you whether you've heard this before. I don't believe in God. I believe in science. Um, there's no scientific proof for that. So I cannot believe it. For anything to be believable, it has to be scientific. Have you ever heard anything like this before? You, you hear this a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've heard this definitely. Yes. That is scientism. Person, a lot of times who's, you know, just repeating this is just somebody a lot of times who has no idea really what true science is. You know what I mean? Has probably even taken a science class. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, usually uh, what it's like is it, it's a get out of jail card. Right? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, okay, I don't really have a way of responding to you. Okay, so, you know, 
give me scientific evidence, like mm -hmm. for God, right? So what we need to do is we actually need to break down this worldview, this actual philosophy, this actual religion of scientism. So the first thing to know about these people is that they say for something to be knowledge, it has to have scientific evidence. And if something does not have scientific evidence, therefore it cannot be knowledge, right? And later on uh, in the discussions, they would say things like, well, since there is no scientific evidence for God, there is no God, because they consider the only type of evidence to be scientific evidence. So that's the first claim we're going to break down, inshallah. So that's what we're going to start with. Okay, go ahead. Let's break that down. Okay, so we can ask a series of questions to the person. We can ask them. So you've said that you only believe in knowledge if it can be scientifically verified. And the person would obviously mm -hmm. say yes, because that's what they were alluding to earlier. Mm -hmm. You can ask them a series of questions. You can ask them, okay, my, my friend, uh, do you have a great, 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 going back 50, 60 generations, a grandfather? Do you, do you actually have um, a grandfather going back 50, 60 generations? What, what are they going to say? Yes. They're going to say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's just say I was to push it a bit and say, are you sure about that? Are you like certain you have knowledge of this? No doubt. They'll say no doubt. No doubt. Exactly. Then I'll say to them, well, can you give me any scientific evidence for the existence of your 50th generation going back um, grandfather? What scientific evidence is there? They'll say, I got some pictures of me and grandpa. Okay, good. Now, the problem there is, if the pictures did exist, how do we know that's actually your grandpa? It could just be your great uncle. It could be some other guy. But going back 50 generations, obviously, there were no pictures back then. Yeah. So what other sort of evidence could they use? So they're gonna they're gonna go ahead and pretty much uh, testify testifiable as, as evidence, you know, so that because it's come down from my my uh, my mother, my father, my grandfather, yeah. etc. Yeah, exactly. So they're gonna say, well, this I know because my mom told me and my dad told me, and they were told by their parents that. So going back, th this must have happened. There's also something else, right? So that what you just referred to correctly is known as testimony, right? That's a root of knowledge as well, independent of science. So we know history to, through testimony. How do we know, for example, um, that Caesar existed or Genghis Khan existed or Napoleon existed? People that we do believe existed. It's not through science. It's actually through testimony. testimony. Now, if they're, yeah, if they're to turn around and say, well, I could somehow find my grandfather's grave and do a DNA test. Well, even if you could find your grandfather's 50 generations going back his particular grave you haven't done that test right now but you believe right now that that is your grandfather did exist uh, going back 50 generations so that's testimonial knowledge there's also something else that they could respond with they could say well i exist my father existed and going back logically his father must have existed and going back using using logical deduction my 50th generation grandfather must have existed. That's just pure logic going down. So again, that's another root of knowledge, which is logic, which has nothing to do with uh, science. So, so far, just by one question, we've got two sources of knowledge which are independent of science. Now I could ask um, a third, uh, sorry, a second question uh, to um, the person asking. So wait, go, go ahead, start. So yeah, testimony, what was the other one? Logic. Logic, yes. Yeah. So you're using logic to come up with um, conclusions, mm -hmm. right? That's got nothing to do with uh, science. Uh, science. Okay. So you could ask them another question. You could say to them, okay, do you believe that if you see a child being run over deliberately, that you see that happening, there's an evil person and they run over a child and they kill a child. You see this horrific sight. Do you feel that that is evil? Do you feel that that is wrong? They what would they, what would they say? They're going to agree, yeah. They're going to agree, yes. And do you believe that if somebody ran in front and saved the child just before it got hit, that that would be a good thing? It's a hero, yes. Okay, so these feelings that you have, these morals that you have, right? How passionate are, are you about these things? 
Very passionate. Very passionate. In fact, Eddie, human history is a history of people rising up for moral reasons. You know, you have you have the entire history of humanity. When you break it down, you find that there were moral movements throughout history. Even today, we get massive moral social movements. So if someone says, I only believe in something if it can be scientifically demonstrated or verified or proved, then we could simply say, then we could simply say to them, Well, that child being saved or that child horrifically being killed, there is no scientific evidence for right and wrong, but you believe in it. And you believe it to be true. So, if you're to deny uh, knowledge that does not uh, knowledge that um, does not come through science, you are to deny good and bad and duties, and you're to deny morality and, in fact, civilization. In fact, you are denying what makes us human, right? So, so far we have logic, we have testimony, and we have morality, our belief in morals. So. Just by asking a few questions, we can actually show that scientism is falling apart. Now, I'm going to ask another question to the person. I'm going to say to them, do you believe that the world is real, that you and I are talking right now and the world is real? Yeah. They're gonna, say, yeah, they're yeah gonna absolutely. OK, well, if this world is real, then what is the scientific evidence that the world is real? There is actually no argument you can make that using science that uh, this world is real. All you could simply say is, well, for science to even work, for anything to even make sense, the world being real is something we axiomatically all accept. We all accept it. It's something for which we don't need to give scientific evidence for, but it's knowledge we all have. So now we have self-evident truths, things that we know to be true, but we don't actually, uh, we can't actually prove those things scientifically. So, so far we've had, um, you know, a, a few uh, uh, roots of knowledge. There's also um, a, something else that we could speak about, which is mathematics. We could ask them, you know, A squared plus B squared is C squared, right? You do this in school, you know, you solve all these things. Are those things scientific knowledge? No, those are mathematical knowledge. So using these different uh, types of thought experiments, we can show them that, your scientism worldview actually completely falls apart just by asking a few surface level questions. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference now between scientism and science? Good. So science is the application of reason to the natural world. It is a way of understanding, explaining, analyzing, making predictions, and so on and so forth. So science is a beautiful thing. We love science. We don't have a problem with science. Science is a method of trying to gain knowledge about the real world. Now, we have no problem with someone that believes in science because we believe in science. When someone takes science and says, no, this root of knowledge is the only root of knowledge. Everything else is irrelevant. That is scientism, where they've taken the garb of science and they've actually excessively applied it to other domains of knowledge and, and tried to monopolize them and said, no, the only type of knowledge is scientific knowledge. So that's the difference between scientism and science. What are the main claim claims of scientism? So we covered... Uh, their claim about monopolizing knowledge. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we see is that usually the proponents of scientism um, in, in the popular culture, and I don't want to get into the academic discussion about scientism and the academic definitions because those are different to what we face in the public. But one of the things that proponents usually, uh, and, and you get this a lot at colleges, universities, you, you get this a lot um, in, in terms of uh, the internet atheists, is they will make claims of science being certain, science giving absolute knowledge, you know, that science is there to give you knowledge which is not going to change, which is absolutely certain. And that's a claim that we can actually challenge through, uh, you know, again, asking a few questions. So what we could do about this claim is we could ask them, is it not true that a scientific theory that we have today, we are basing it upon the knowledge that we have gained? So that's something that we all agree about. However, isn't it also true that we haven't got all of the information that's in the world? So tomorrow, 
we could gain a novel piece of data or a novel uh, uh, you know, observation which could challenge our previous theory. That, that's a very simple point. You don't have all the knowledge in the world. Tomorrow you can come up with something that you haven't seen before that can contradict your previous theory. This in the philosophy of science is known as the problem of induction, that you cannot be certain of a theory that you've come up with today because tomorrow you can come up with an observation or a piece of data that will contradict your previous theory. So that's the first point that we can make, and it's, it's known as a problem in, uh, of induction. The second point is underdetermination. Underdetermination. So underdetermination is that using the same data, we can come up with many different types of inferences. We can come up with many different types of ways of looking at uh, the ways of looking at the conclusion. So I I'll ask you a, a question on this. Say I give you five dollars, right? And I tell you to go down to downtown Chicago and I want you to use up the five dollars and to buy apples and oranges. So you have to come back both with apples and oranges, okay? And say the apple costs one dollar and the orange costs one dollar. So both of those items are one dollar. And I sent you away with this. You have to spend the full five dollars. And when you come back, I want you to bring apples and oranges. And both of them are one dollar each. OK, now. What are you going to come back with when you when you come back uh, from shopping? Apples and oranges and, and no money. <laughs> apples and oranges, no money. Exactly. Now, here, here's the problem, Eddie, right? You could get three oranges and two apples. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Or you can get four oranges and one apple. So you get the point. There's many different mm -hmm. combinations. Using the data that you have to use $5, using the data is $1 each, and you have to get both apples and oranges. Just those three pieces of data, you can come back with a lot of combinations. Yeah. Likewise, a theory is inferred from the data, but the data we can use to infer other theories. Okay, this is known as underdetermination. Now, a lot of the time, um, these people who believe in scientism and are using the garb of scientism, as you rightly pointed out, they probably haven't even done a science class uh, at a graduate level, right? So they'll usually run away by the time you've, you've highlighted just one or two problems. But just, just for the sake of it, I'll just quickly go over some more. We also have theory ladenness, uh, in which the theory colors the data. Uh, we also have a um, uh, problem of unconceived alternatives where there are solutions to uh, the, the data that we have, but we can't think of them because we haven't actually conceived of them. This happened during the time that uh, we can see between Newton and Einstein. And then uh, there's another issue of methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. You know, Eddie, even before you get to these points, you usually find that you don't need to go that far. Yeah. <laughs> They realize that they try to hoodwink you and, you know, you're not having it. It's over. It's, yeah, it's over, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, other, there's one claim. I think this is the most preposterous is that science disproves the creator God. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the most ridiculous one. Yeah. So what you because, find... because, because haven't there been I mean, there are so many scientists and I want to get into this uh, in a few that now the institution has been pretty much set up. That it's an atheist secular institute, and these secular institutions, atheism is the the religion pretty much. And yeah. now all these people who who fight for creationism, you know, they've kind of been blacklisted. You know, they're the ones who are not invited to the parties. They're like, it's like they don't even exist. Yeah. So, but they're scientists also. They're also academics who went to the same schools. Ab absolutely. And look, I think the first point to note here is they're using an argument. And their argument is this. Hey, look, guys, look at all these scientists, you know, all of them today or most of them or a large percentage of them, they happen to be agnostic or atheist. So therefore, agnosticism or atheism must be coming from science. That's mm -hmm. their basic argument. Yeah. Right. And they'll throw out all sorts of statistics like 90 something percent in the American Association of Scientists or whatever, uh, uh, do not believe in a personal God and all this type of stuff. And you find 
people like Richard Dawkins, who are quite well known, popularizing these arguments in their books. Now, the problem with this argument is let's just not break down why this argument's wrong. Let's actually use this argument against them. So their argument is, oh, wow, look at all these scientists today and they all must be, um, you know, uh, they all uh, doubt uh, the existence of a personal God. So therefore, we should all basically become atheists. Um, the problem with this argument is this is a very small snapshot of history. If we actually go back and we look at the entire um, scientific enterprise over hundreds of years, we will find that the majority of the scientists were theists. They were people who believed in God. So if we're to use this argument for the 19th century, 20th century, uh, 21st century, going back all, all the way to the 10th century, and if we're to do that, then we would say the vast majority of scientists throughout history were theists. That's why we should all become theists. So the problem with the argument is it can work against them. The second thing is it's not actually a valid argument. If all the sign, if all the scientists in the world today decided uh, something that they believed in, right? Does that mean that we should all like sheep without thinking start following them? That that's not true at all. What we need to understand is that the atheism and agnosticism of today, which generally dominates uh, the scientific domain in terms of the Western world, this has cultural um, origins more than anything to do with science itself. So we have to understand that this argument is not valid. It works against them. And two, um, it, it's trying to invoke this type of sheepish behavior from us. But the fact is, we shouldn't actually fall for those types of arguments. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that science can do to undermine God's existence. The issue they have is scientism. They say, because there is no scientific evidence of God, therefore there is no God. And we're going we're gonna to turn around and say to them, we never said there has to be scientific evidence for God. We can come up with rational arguments for God. The problem with you guys is you think rationality and science is the same thing, which is the problem of scientism. Mm -hmm. That takes me back to what you, you mentioned, a um, prominent, uh, I would say, because you've uh, extensively studied, uh, I mean, um, debated, and you've got a lot of knowledge in this new atheism. What's the difference, before, before I ask, my, ask, uh, ask you my question, atheism for people that I know and this when you put the term new atheism, what's the difference now? Sure. Atheism and new atheism. And then sure. I'll ask you my question. Yeah, that's a very good question, actually, because it can get confusing. So atheism is generally a position in which you do not believe there is a God or you are, um, you know, you're. Well, you have agnostic atheism as well, where people are kind of like unsure. But it's just a position that somebody holds that, look, I don't believe in God. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm an atheist, right? New atheism is actually a social movement, or it we can say it was a social movement. It's really dying down now. So this movement was really spearheaded after 9-11 um, by the likes of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, and Christopher Hitchens, who are known as the four horsemen of atheism. And their ideas collectively came out. So you had the God delusion coming out by Richard Dawkins. You had the end of faith. You had God is not great. Um, I forgot Daniel Dennett's book. And all these guys started publishing books. They started doing conferences. They started doing debates. Their view was, okay, we're going to finish religion. You know, we're going to kill religion. We're going to do this. We're gonna... And you can see this in their videos, them openly saying this. And it turned out to be a really flat-footed assumption of theirs that they could just, you know, swipe away Islam, swipe away Christianity, just swipe away faith from the hearts of people. Because, you know, back in 2006, when they were making these types of noises, we're here in 2021. And what we find is that their movement basically fell apart <laughs> it, it didn't really gain uh, as many followers as they actually wanted to they even wanted to move into politics some of them right mm -hmm. um i mean i mean other new atheists started uh, you know rallying for these types of reason rally in america and you know all this type of stuff um but but that's that's the actual difference that one is a social contemporary movement and one is just a position that someone holds
So is it safe to say these are like the radical atheists, like the ISIS atheists? <laughs> well, uh, the the thing which is very interesting, and I'm glad you get you, you get my point. These no, are no, the no. ones. These are the ones who are kind of uh, the extreme atheists. Well, we what we what we would say is that um, say w w when you come up with because uh, didn't didn't Sam Harris wasn't he the one that said I'd blow up Mecca? We should well, we should actually actually one of the things he wrote about was nuking nuking new, yes new nuking new uh, Mecca. Um, and also what you find uh, amongst them is they openly talk about discriminating against Muslims and doing these types of things. Yeah. However, um, Eddie, I think it's very important to understand that these people, they do, they do not call for violence. So even when, he, when Sam Harris says these things, he's saying them as a hypothetical thing. So, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be violent themselves or call for violence. But what we do need to understand is they don't have power. Right, they don't actually have power. They just have uh, the ability to write some books and and so you know. They're, so they're playing the system. But if like if they had the power, it'd be a different story. Well, I I wouldn't say if these guys had the power, they would actually be violent. What I would say is let's look at what happened when atheists did have power. That's the point. Yeah, when you so look for at example, uh, the you know communist Russia, you know the hundreds of millions of people, not hundreds. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, one of the stats is a hundred million people died yeah. in the 20th century because of communist, uh, you well, know. How many died during the reign of the Bolsheviks? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You you get um, you know horrific crimes against religious uh, communities. You get you know all these types of uh, destruction of uh, religious property. Uh, innocent people get killed. You know, and we see this in. Um, for example, uh, not only uh, when uh, these communist uh, countries take over, um, you know, uh, their own uh, regions, but also when they take over Central Asian countries uh, like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and all these places. Be so because you often hear, the, you know, the cliche, the argument, the mantra that people are like, oh, religions are the cause of all war. Right. But I mean, exactly. when, you, when, you, when you get down to the nitty and gritty, I mean, it's actually the people who are godless, who don't believe in a God because there's no moral compass so they can do whatever they want. And, and historically, this is what we see. Even currently, what's happening, uh, uh, modern day Inquisition is happening What right now with the uh, with the Uyghur Muslims, right? And that's a communist yeah. party that's killing, raping, and the world is like asleep. Absolutely. And the thing is, when these people say, look, we're peaceful atheists, but we're just, you know, intellectually trying to challenge you guys. We would return and say to them, well, that's fine. You know, you're peaceful and all of that, you guys. But look at what the people who subscribe to your worldview have done in the past. So you can't say this against the Muslim community. Oh, Muslims are violent because this, this, this thing happened and those people share your faith. And then when it comes to the people who share your faith, because atheism is a faith, mm -hmm. that you don't need to answer for them. I mean, we will openly condemn terrorism. We will openly condemn extremism. We'll openly condemn these things. But you guys, you don't even accept that they're part of your flock when they clearly are. Stalin, Lenin, Chairman Mao. Who were these people? They weren't Christians or Muslims or Jewish people. They were militant atheists and they believed. They actually believed and uh, reinforce this throughout their territory that they wanted to basically replace religion and have themselves and their ideologies as the supreme things. Because um, if you don't believe in God, if you do not have any belief in God, if you uh, re reject the hereafter and you have ultimate uh, power, you know, in their minds, at least the, the, the sort of power that they thought they had, then what's to stop that evil that they have within themselves? Right. And that's why you find mass atrocities committed by these atheists in the 20th century. So you can take a you can make a good guess that the people that you mentioned, these are like the modern day prophets for the new atheism, these militant atheists. Now, the new who follow this new atheism, I mean, you can just take a good guess. Like what side would they be on? Where would they kind of like fit in if they had the power? Well, why? why it's, not, it's, it's not a far stretch what, of the why? imagination where someone is talking about you know, oh, we should nuke it. But, you know, if they had the power, why wouldn't they press the button? Well, th th this is quite interesting because I think a lot of these people would never want atheists to have that much political power. And, you know, it's very interesting. I've actually been seeing um, amongst some of these atheists that they see a utility in religion. As long as someone else does the believing, 
right? Because they know themselves, they know themselves deep down that they would rather be in a society in which you have, you know, you have uh, many different religions, many different systems, many different things going on, then be in a state like communist Russia or, or you know, these states which are, you know, where, where there's only one ideology and they have all this type of power. But I mean, definitely uh, with people like uh, uh, Sam Harris and, 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 you know, these like who, who openly advocate, uh, you know, these types of ideas, one can only guess what's going through their head and what would happen if they actually had power. Yeah, it's crazy. So let's go back to uh, because it's intertwined all together, uh, scientism, and then how would you fit in evolution with scientism? That's a good point. It, doesn't that kick it off? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's like um, it, once they get the first assumption wrong, once they you know uh, the first assumption wrong yes once they step into the arena with the wrong lens then everything else starts messing up so if they go into um evolutionary uh, theory with the idea that science is the only root of knowledge with the idea that uh, science is certain and with the idea that science undermines god which are the three main claims uh, that you you hear these uh, popularizers uh, uh, talk about then you'll come up with really absurd conclusions so one of the things that these guys do is they say evolutionary theory undermines darwinian theory undermines the existence of god it does away with god's existence there is no need for god's existence now this is one of the most popular ideas out there that somehow darwin came along and he absolutely destroyed uh, intellectually uh, the any idea of, of, of there being a divine being. Now, what's interesting about this is although you find people like Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, and all these people uh, saying this, they themselves, deep down, know this is not the case. Darwin was never an atheist. This is something very interesting. Hold on. See, this is a lot of people don't know this. I mean, this is something that is just for someone listening to you right now. Please repeat that. Yeah. So Darwin was never an atheist. In fact, Darwin did not like his theory being used to buttress atheism. In fact, he said in my wildest fluctuations, I was never an atheist. When he published his book in 1859, he was what we would call a deist, according to his own words, a deist. A deist is somebody who believes in God, but does not believe in religion. So when he published The Origin of Species, he believed in God. Prior to that, some decades back, he was a Christian. Near the end of his life, he became an agnostic because of the problem of evil and suffering. Now, what they do is they only take what fits their narrative so when darwin openly says that you know someone can be a, a theist and believe in his theory they'll ignore that part but what they will do is when darwin is for example being attacked by uh, like he was attacked by some christians when he was alive they would use that and say look they were suppressing him and you know he was being mocked and this and that so they try and create this false dichotomy it was darwin versus theism darwin versus god when darwin was a lot more sophisticated in his thinking and he was a lot more respectful to the belief in God and a lot more respectful, in fact, to uh, Christianity as well. Most people don't know. They hear the term evolution. They ascribe that it's scientific. It's golden. This is the new discoveries. We're in, in, we're in the modern day. Uh, so I want to I'm going to share this video with you and let's just kind of, you know, um, look through it real quickly and then get your thoughts on it. See, notice one thing I want to show you got good production, you got a story, and you got a lot of funds. So I'll kind of go through this quickly. You're familiar, you're a biologist, you're familiar yeah. with all these, right? Okay, keep going, keep going. So one time we were fish. 
This is the evolution process they're explaining, correct? Yeah. Okay. So now we're about to take a big jump now. Now we're out of the water and we're climbing trees. Now we're in the world of the apes, monkeys. And here you go. And this is uh, Subhur here on the Dean Show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that pretty accurate? That's like the mainstream? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is the traditional view of the tree of life and how life evolved um, uh, and stuff. However, I just want to point out some things. Just within the few seconds of the opening, yeah. there's a huge, huge um, statement that was there with absolutely no evidence today right there the so what they'll say is okay so in the beginning there was the cell right there was the cell and that cell came from primordial soup or whatever right you, you have all these all these different ideas that they ha have now they call this abiogenesis they call this from non life to life right now we need to simply ask them what is the evidence for this and just by that question, you will rattle them. <laughs> you you will actually repeat the, them. Re repeat the question. You can simply ask them, what is the evidence for abiogenesis? What is the evidence that life came from non-life? And also, what is the evidence that there was one origin of life, that there was one self-replicating molecule, cell, whatever? Just ask them this question and see what their response is. Because... You know, you, you know, you can get into all sorts of uh, uh, deep uh, technical analysis of all these models that they have. A great uh, scientist to look at this is uh, Dr. James Tor. Uh, he blows out of the water all of these, uh, you know, pathetic claims that they've worked out abiogenesis. They worked out how life came from non-life. But you can simply ask them, OK, so you just made this claim and this supposedly happened four billion years ago. Um, can you explain to us what's the evidence for this? So and you'd be very surprised if they even give you an answer. Yeah, that's that's deep. I mean, so that goes back to is it a belief or is it fact? Because you have to take a, a big a leap of faith, what they usually again attribute to religion and God. So yeah. because so you're is it synonymous with what you're saying as if you're asking for observable, testable evidence? Yeah, so you know, I think this is where um it, it's very important for us to talk about. It is way more than just a scientific claim. They have faith in this. This is, if you like, the atheist Genesis story. <laughs> this is their origin story. They have absolutely no evidence that there was one cell, right? And, and four billion years ago, these things happened. But since they believe there is no God, then they have to come up with some sort of story. And that is the story mm. that they actually come up with. Now, I have respect for those uh, evolutionary biologists and those uh, uh, philosophers who openly speak up and criticize these issues. So what we'll find is that, uh, and here I'm going to uh, speak about atheists and agnostics. I'm not talking about Christians or Muslims or Jewish people or anybody with some sort of uh, uh, belief in religion. So we have people like um, uh, the atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel, who wrote the book uh, Mind in Cosmos, um, uh, which is published by Oxford University. And he mentions this. He actually mentions that, you know, the idea that life came from non-life and all of this naturalistically evolved. This is not something based on scientific evidence. This is some uh, a, a paradigm which they have. And it's just, uh, you know, difficult to actually question and anybody that tries to question it is is actually you know uh, ridiculed then you get people like uh jerry folder who you know when he tried to question uh darwinism he was called a secular creationist they couldn't call him a creationist because he was an atheist then you get people like james shapiro uh masotashi nai lynn margulis you get these biologists who openly say that um you know darwinian evolution is a, is essentially a religion Right. In fact, Lynn Margulis uh, says something very interesting. She was the late wife of uh, Carl Sagan, the famous uh, physicist. Right. So although she was an atheist, she said, you know, history will judge neo-Darwinism to be an Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo religion. 
right? So the problem here is that there is a huge pressure in academia to suppress information which goes against uh, Darwin's theory and and, and you know the uh, the uh, the worry about creationism and you know these these guys coming in. There's a fantastic documentary. Uh, uh, creationist. On... What do you say back to them when they say you're a creationist? Did I hit it? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In an so unguided the... and undesigned way, the theory of evolution. Excuse me. Yes, Ben. How did life begin in the first place? Mr. Stein, you have the same question every time. Well, you never every... answer it, sir. It develops, it dis, we are, dis, you, you know, we've been through this so many times, you have Could me so- Could there have been an intelligent designer? Sorry, I cut you off, but uh, yeah, did, yeah. I, did, did I hit it right? It's like, well, we play, did, is that you, the one? That's the one, and that documentary is amazing. We uh, didn't plan, we didn't plan this, see? No, no, but yeah. this is an amazing documentary. What The first person you showed was actually uh, Dr. Jonathan Wells, right? Um, so you find him in there, you find Stephen Meyer, you, you find uh, Michael Behe, Paul uh, Nelson, and some of these people, alhamdulillah, they've come onto my channel and I've actually interviewed them as well. The fact is that these are people who were academically uh, not given the freedom to express their views because they were coming up with information going against you know, Darwinian theory, the, the contemporary ideas that we actually have. So these are guys associated with the intelligent design movement, the movement which is there to not just say, okay, let's just um, take, uh, you know, Darwinian evolution, throw it out, and let's just start teaching religion. No, these are people who are saying, no, let's have a discussion. You can have your Darwinian evolution. We can have our intelligent design hypothesis. Let's have a scientific discussion. And they're being denied that. So, you know, no free and uh, no intelligence allowed is the name of the documentary. And right near the end of the documentary, when it comes to the origin of life, remember I told you, Eddie, they don't really have an answer. Mm -hmm. When Richard Dawkins was asked about the origin of life, he actually said it's possible that life originated from aliens who sent down life on Earth. Right? I don't know if you've seen, go ahead, finish. That's crazy. I always say that whenever I'm talking about the topic of atheism, I always mention that they always, and this is the lay person, they come out and they start talking, they won't believe in the creator, but they'll start talking about aliens. Yeah. And you know, what's, what's interesting is they'll try and label it in a very fancy way. So for example, the actual term for this is called panspermia panspermia and francis crick uh the one who discovered the uh the double helix uh, shape of the dna he's the one who proposed this idea he was an atheist and he couldn't explain the complexity of life so he had this idea that life was sent to earth via rockets from you know extraterrestrials living someplace else and you know when richard dawkins was because uh, you know obviously he's a fan of crick and when he was asked by um uh, by the interviewer in, in this particular documentary near the end that, okay, so if life was sent down by these aliens um, to, to Earth, where did the aliens come from? And he said they evolved from Darwinian evolution. <laughs> so, so basically, it's just passing on the buck. It's laughable uh, at this point. Uh, but but it's, it's crazy. People still keep buying their books. People still Absolutely. keep, you know, still in line to get more of the stories. But like I said, when I... Uh, showed you this um, clip as a story. It's good production and it's well funded. <laughs> Let me get into that uh, clip. Uh, that's part of the documentary that I wanted to show you. Well, I usually don't get the opportunity. What's at stake for you personally here? First of all, I love science. I think the way Darwinism corrupts the evidence, distorts the evidence, is bad for science. Uh, well, the other scientists would tell you to just shut up if you love science. Okay. <laughs> Because you're sort of you're sort of being a bomb thrower into science. I am upsetting the apple cart, and I yeah. think I think it deserves to be upset in this case. Why? Because the evidence is being distorted to prop up a theory that I think doesn't fit it. Was Darwinism really that bad? Perhaps a change of scenery would give me a fresh perspective. So that it could be correct. That's a very different question. One of, one of my um, prevailing doctrines about Darwinian theory is, man, that, that thing is just a mess. It's like looking into a room full of smoke. 
Um, noth nothing in the theory is precisely, clearly, carefully defined or delineated. It lacks all of the rigor one expects from mathematical physics, and mathematical physics lacks all the rigor one expects from mathematics. So we're talking about a gradual descent down the level of intelligibility until we reach evolutionary biology. We don't even know what a species is, for heaven's sakes. So his theory is smoke, but elegant smoke. There's a certain elegance to it, but you know, I think Einstein had the appropriate remark. He preferred to leave elegance to his tailor. A room full of smoke? That certainly wasn't what I was hearing from prominent Darwinists like Richard Dawkins. Evolution is a fact. It's a fact which is established as securely as essentially any other fact that we have in science. Richard Dawkins is so confident that evolution is a fact and that therefore God doesn't exist that he has devoted his entire life to spreading the evolution gospel. I'm an atheist with respect to the Judeo-Christian God because there is not a shred of evidence in favor of the Judeo-Christian God. It is, it is completely right to say that since the evidence for evolution is so absolutely, totally overwhelming, nobody who looks at it could possibly doubt that if they were sane uh, and not stupid. So the only remaining possibility is that they're ignorant, and, the most, and most people who don't believe in evolution are indeed ignorant. But the people I spoke with weren't ignorant. They were highly credentialed scientists. So there had to be something else going on here. So you think the whole theory of evolution is false or just certain parts of it? Well, again, evolution is a slippery word. I would say minor changes within species happen. But Darwin didn't write a book called how species, how existing species change over time. He wrote a book called The Origin of Species. He purported oh. to show how this same process I leads to new species, in I fact, see. every species. And the evidence for that grand claim is, in my opinion, almost totally lacking. How does Darwin or, or Dar Darwinism say that life began? Well, he didn't know, and in fact, nobody knows. So. Darwinism, strictly defined, starts after the origin of life. From the back to the front, uh, nobody knows, but we know. It's in the Quran. It's yeah. it's there. But we're talking about from the academic circles here. They don't know, but you have um, in the beginning, he talks about these scientists are talking about it's like a room of smoke, ele elegant smoke. Yeah, I mean, this is where you know, we can give people a very good solution. We can say to them, look, when you are working within the field of science, when you're at university or any of these things, you can accept any scientific theory, even Darwinian evolution, as a valid scientific theory, paradigm model, but you don't accept it to be literally true. Because the real issue here, Eddie, is that people don't understand the philosophy of science and nor do they understand the science itself when it comes to evolutionary theory. They don't understand the alternatives to Darwinian evolution like intelligent design because intelligent design is not allowed to be taught. In fact, crit uh, crit uh, uh, critics of Darwin who themselves are not even Christian or Muslim or, or have any faith, they themselves have also been, uh, you know, sidelined. So if a theory is, you know, so robust, then why are they afraid of a bit of criticism? Why are they afraid of actually having a dialogue? Like these guys that you just um, showed in this documentary, rather than cancelling them, wasn't it better to actually bring them into a room, ask them, where's your argument? Where's my argument? Okay, let's have it. And is a natural selection of ideas until someone wins? But we don't have that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite sad. They want to shut down the debate. I mean... They have, they, sorry, they have shut down the debate. They, in academia... If you say intelligent design, like uh, if you try and publish a paper, if you it, you cannot, there is no debate in academia on this right now in a significant way because they are cancelling people left, right, and centre. In fact, people are scared of actually saying that they're planning on writing stuff on this. Wow, that is deep. If you think about it, I mean, this just takes you down to just, you know. Um, you know, you can just go in so many directions here. If you think about this now, we're a freedom of speech. We're in America, right? We should be able to talk ideas. Now, I think everyone should watch this documentary. I've, you've just recommended it. I recommended it also before. Expelled, no intelligence allowed. Because it shows these are academic scientists who believe in a creator. And now they're being silenced. They're being blacklisted. They cannot come out freely and talk about this. Yeah. Why? 
because it goes against what the religion of 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 um of secularism yeah i mean i i, I think there's a there's something very important and i think this is a good point to wrap up um uh, the, the, this whole segment on and let, let me just add one more thing and sure. this is what the our youth this is what the muslims are getting and, and christians and everyone they're, they're getting exposed to they're getting and this religion is pushed on you now scientism evolution this you know this whole yeah. again not denying evolution you know to you can go ahead and, and you know the parts that uh the, the difference between micro and macro and whatnot you know yeah i mean the thing is look generally the idea of evolution was known before darwin um so we're not talking about the general observation uh, of evolution we're talking about Dar darwin's particular claims about uh, could you call it apt adaptation yeah i mean you could call it adaptation but the real issue here is darwin's twin claims of universal common ancestry and all of this happening naturally right without um a, you know uh well, neo-Darwinism today, which obviously moved away from Darwin, becoming a lot more milit militantly atheistic. You know how, uh, as Richard Dawkins calls it, the blind watchmaker. You know, there is no God. Mm -hmm. So that's the real issue here. Now, what's very interesting is we are not the people, Muslims or Christians or, or people of faith. We are not the people who said Darwinian evolution is a religion. We're not. The first person to actually say that Darwinism was a religion, that evolutionary humanism is a religion, is actually a Darwinist. So Julian Huxley was a very important figure in the early 20th century. Um, he was somebody who was a philosopher, an atheist philosopher, a biologist. He contributed significantly to neo-Darwinism, the, the contemporary theory that we actually have. And he believed that Darwinism what he termed evolutionary humanism, he believed it was a religion. He actually called it a religion. Wow. Now, he's written a book in the 1930s, I believe, or early 40s, and it's called Religion Without Revelation. Religion, you can Google it right now. The book is called Religion Without Revelation. Without Revelation. In, yeah. In this book, that religion without revelation is evolutionary humanism. In his book, um, New Bottles for New Wine, which uh, I, I was just reading uh, just two days ago, again, he makes uh, claims about, you know, uh, Darwinian evolution. You can see for him it's something way more than, than just that. And I just want to highlight something about Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley believed that in, in, the, in the same way today, uh, in his time in the 40s, nobody believed that the earth, uh, everyone accepted that the earth was not flat. Right. Everyone accepted that, the, you know, that the flat theory was wrong. He said in the same way, in the future, no one will believe in God. And he believed that evolutionary humanism should be evangelized to the entire world. He actually believed this. Now, he wasn't just a, a lone wolf. He went on and, and Eddie, this is really going to send some shivers up your spine. He went on to become the founding father of UNESCO the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. UNESCO's first guy was Julian Huxley. You can go and Google this. Wow. And UNESCO has an influence in terms of the entire world. So we need to understand, this guy was an ideologue. He believed that this re new religion needed to be evangelized. And he had this very important political position. Now, in 2016, the most well-known Darwinian author in the world, the most well-known Darwinian academic in the world, the atheist philosopher Michael Roos, he wrote a book. And this book, I just want you to just understand the significance of this book. This book was called Darwinism as Religion. Darwinism as Religion. And this was published by none other than Oxford University, right? So you have an atheist philosopher publishing a book by Oxford University, how much more credible can we get from their camp, right? And he's far more uh, uh, he's far more uh, uh, greater in status than people like Richard Dawkins in the field of Darwinian evolution. Now, he, in, in that book, he basically argues from the onset till today, Darwinian evolution may be a th scientific theory, but it has been more than that. It has been a perspective beyond just a scientific theory. It has been a religion. Right. So what I want people to understand 
especially people who disagree with us, is we're not the ones saying that Darwinian evolution is a religion. This is your guys. And it's your ideologues who've been behind this sociological movement to try and evangelize the world towards a Darwinian perspective. And that goes back to what I was trying to say was now you're going into a university and if you're not equipped knowing these things and now you see the professor and he's following his prophet who's Richard Dawkins and now this is someone who is spewing beautiful, you know, what you perceive as, you know, uh, beautiful rhetoric and you're like wow you're just amazed at the words he's using and you're not well grounded in your dean first of all and you don't know many of these things that you just uncovered this is so important that you know these things you know that a lot of this stuff that they go ahead and teach this stuff is baseless it's not on evidence like you said you know this is a story it's funded very well and then you end up, end up you know leaving your dean because of this absolutely and i would add to that eddie that you have some very good professors as well uh, you have some people who are, although they're atheists, although they are Darwinists themselves, they would not be ideologically driven in the same way people like Richard Dawkins are. So it, on YouTube, you will find a talk between myself and a professor at the University of Birmingham, uh, Professor Jeremy Pritchard, who is a specialist in his field. And we go over this, right? Even though he's on, a, he's in a different camp, he, he's an atheist and I'm a Muslim and he's, uh, uh, you know, an um we're not going to agree on everything uh, That discussion we had is called Does evolution undermine God And he agreed that it doesn't And you get professors like this who are open Who say no, you know This is not true, you know This isn't something that undermines belief in God And it is much more complex than that Much more sophisticated than that Much more nuanced than that But it's people like Richard Dawkins who wants this war in the classroom between believers and, and atheists and, and you, he wants to make it look like you have to be one or the other and you have to be at each other's throats when we're actually trying to give a much more um, academic type of discourse here. Yeah. So if anybody's but, interested, they can go watch that talk as well. As we wrap up now, um, just a couple more points. Uh, I want to ask a couple more questions. So it really at the end, it's not, the bottom line is not truth in this in these academic settings it's the bottom line is not it should be ultimately if it's science and you're following science and you want to get to the truth of the matter but at the end of the day if you watch this documentary it's like okay everything else can possibly you know we can entertain it you know uh the piggybacking of on the crystals you know that theory we can entertain this but as soon as it comes to intelligent design no no no, no. even if that's the truth we won't accept that yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. And what we need to do, as as uh, especially as Muslims, is you can have a large part of the world believing something, and we know this as Muslims, but that doesn't mean that it's true. So you can have a large part of the world which right after 9-11 believed Islam was a certain type of ideology, but all those ideas were wrong. All of those you know, people churning out those things they were all wrong. So just because a lot of people are saying the same thing, sometimes we, even we as Muslims, we think, man, I don't want to be the, like the black sheep, uh, you know, sticking out in a crowd. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be, you know, uh, I just want to be with, you know, with everybody. I want to conform. But actually Darwin himself stood out. He was like, no, this is, you know, like he didn't agree with the people of his time. So he came up with his own theory. So there's nothing wrong with being that black sheep. There's nothing wrong with standing up and saying, no, you know, we are going to stand up uh, to this. We're going to, I mean, look, look at it from this perspective. Racism, say, uh, 60 years ago was completely acceptable, right? In places like America. Then you had, you know, Rosa Parks. You had, you had these people who stood up and said, no, we're not going to accept this. And, and you find this... And, other parts of the world you find this in indigenous communities which are standing up to say they're spanish occupiers you get this you get this in the indian subcontinent as well so you know we shouldn't be shy of going against the grain we shouldn't be shy as muslims uh, as believers as people who believe uh, that we are upon the truth of going against something that may be very popular in society it shouldn't upset us right it shouldn't scare us we should actually be at the forefront of this. And what I would say is credit uh, is due to the intelligent design guys uh, and, and obviously women as well who are involved um, that they've they've stuck to their guns. You know, they, they've really had this onslaught from all across, uh, you know, um, uh, the atheist world and they've managed to stick in there. 
Yeah, and uh, it, it surprised me. Who was this person again? This is uh, that you said he claimed this term that this evolution is actually a religion and to go ahead and spread this all over the world. And this it, is it, Julian Huxley. That had me thinking, like, what at the end are you spreading? Like, what moral code? What moral compass? What what are you giving to the? What do you have to offer at the end? You know, and then contrast that with when we talk about you know, Islam, for instance, submission to the creator, not the creation. You're talking about spreading justice in the world, ending injustice. You're talking about ending hunger, feeding all of humanity. You're talking about free health care. You're talking about any everything that's good out there. You know, you're talking about spreading peace. Your yeah. peace acquired by submitting your will to God, to the creator. I mean, everything good, pure, this is what we're talking about giving yeah. to the world. Uh, what are they talking about spreading at the end of the day? And you, you've raised a very good point. So I just want to uh, remind uh, everybody of something very important in terms of the history of Darwinism. After Darwin's death, in fact, while he was alive, this movement started that is known today as social Darwinism. Now, social Darwinism is essentially the ideas of Darwin applied to society. Now, today, this is ridiculed as a pseudoscience and no one takes it seriously. However, at the time, this was the good stuff. This was the stuff that was being pumped out of even some universities. The Nazis took it to another level and they started exterminating the weaker uh, uh, segments of their society um, and, you know, people that they saw as, uh, you know, racially inferior. So, you know, social Darwinists, they would see the, the you know, the, the strong capitalists surviving and the weaker, weaker ones, uh, you know, us not having a duty towards them, eugenics, you know. Um, yeah. You know, all this stuff. This this is historically true. No survival, survive, very much. It's survival of the fittest. In fact, today, right now, if you walk past a hospital, that is the survival of the unfittest, and you're paying for it with your tax dollars. That goes against Darwinian theory. Human behavior goes against Darwin's theory. So, um, you know, it's so important that we need to understand ideas like the selfish gene. You know, they promoted this type of capitalist culture. We, we can't deny these things. Now, obviously, there's some evolutionary thinkers today who are saying, oh, that's got nothing to do with us. That's fine. But historically, we know these things happen. And like you said, Islam is there to teach you. You know, I'll tell you something funny, Eddie, right? Why are people kind to each other if it's survival of the fittest? They don't have an answer. So they think, oh, the reason why you're nice is because you expect something back, which they call reciprocal altruism. Or you're, you're nice to somebody because they're related to you because they hold your genes. They call that kin selection. We as Muslims say we're nice to people because we deep down are nice because we have a fitra. We believe in God, right? In fact, human beings generally, right? We have a lot of good within us. We have that good which Islam is trying to amplify, right? That's a much more beautiful idea of human nature than the selfish gene or social Darwinism or sociobiology, all this stuff that they try and uh, color us with. All right, go ahead and leave us with something. Purpose, that's the theme of the Dean Show, trying to get people to reflect, to think about their purpose, why they've been created, why are they here in this life and where are they going when they die? So leave us with something that you can have the university student, the person who follows scientism, and now he's questioning it. Leave us with something to have people, the light bulb go on, and to have them think more about what is the true purpose of life. What do you leave them with? Absolutely. I mean, I would contrast two different perspectives. So one perspective is that we are created to worship God. What is worship? Worship is that we have love, hope, fear in the creator. And everything we do, we do for God alone. We call upon God alone. We make our lives not just a life in which you need to work nine to five and provide for your family and go out with your friends and do these things. But actually, there's a higher purpose of life, having that spiritual connection with God, having that connection with other human beings and being good to them for the sake of God. You know, all of these altruistic higher ethics that Islam teaches, this is the purpose of life. And what, is it, what does Islam essentially teach? Nothing 
is greater than the remembrance of God. So in this life, as Eddie, we know through your story, right? And and we know through the stories of countless people, um, you know, alive today, that, you know, you can have everything this dunya has to offer, but you will not have peace. Ultimate peace comes through the submission of the creator. Now let's contrast this beautiful perspective with what Richard Dawkins says in The Selfish Gene. He says the ultimate rationale of life is survival and reproduction. So <laughs> the fact is, Islam is there to elevate you. And from the other perspective, how different are you from a cow? Like, honestly, in fact, from our perspective, cows worship Allah. But from their perspective, if it's survival and reproduction, you might as well just go to the field. Like, honestly, there's no other way I could put it. We got, this has to be mandatory watching for anyone in university about to go to university. They need to watch this episode. It's a very, very important episode. And inshallah, God willing, this can help save some people who might end up, you know, falling for the trap of shaitan, you know, who's setting these traps and misguiding people. So inshallah, this can be a great benefit. And thank you so much for spending the time. I can go on and on. I really enjoyed talking with you. It was a pleasure. Always a pleasure with you, Eddie. Inshallah, we can do it again sometime soon. Inshallah. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah.